Commissioner Michael Copps is a former uh, FCC commissioner for 10 years. He is known for his tireless and undaunted advocacy for the public interest, which is a term we often throw around here in the world of media reform, but few people really took on the mantle of the public interest and broadened its definition, grew the public interest, said that this isn't just public interest, convenience and necessity, those old words. This is about people, this is about groups, this is about women, this is about diversity, this is about Native Americans, this is about differently abled Americans being able to access um, the media and the communications infrastructures that, that make society possible. So before that he was in the Clinton administration, before that he was uh, sent, uh, worked for the U.S. Senator Fritz Hollings. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage my boss, Michael Copps. Thank you very much and good afternoon all. I'm delighted to uh, see you all here, especially on such a beautiful afternoon when you could be outside enjoying the good weather and doing lots of other things. Uh, but this is, uh, this is spectacular, and I, I thank you for coming. I'm very grateful to the LA Media Reform Group for holding this uh, uh, conference. It's a group that's turned, I think, uh, itself in from a, from a group of just uh, grassroots, uh, grassroots advocates into uh, really an organized force for, for change and for good things that we need to happen in the world of our media ecosystem. So. Thanks uh, to them, thanks for the Common Cause uh, people, Kathy and Brooke and Angela and Todd who put it to, uh, together. Thanks to the Occidental Urban and Environmental Policy Institute, the LA Progressive, anybody else who had a hand in putting uh, this together, we're very, very, uh, very, very grateful for that. I know I saw some of you out of Denver at that media reform conference and I've seen others of you at, uh, uh, at other venues, so. I am really pleased that I'm here, and I'm even more pleased that you are here. Thanks. Uh, it's been, as some of you know, a, uh, a sad and heavy week uh, at Common Cause because we lost our great leader, uh, Bob Edgar, on uh, Tuesday morning. And his, his dedication to the public interest and to human rights and to uh, justice and the common good is just... Uh, uh, legendary, and he's really why I ended up at Common Cause after I left the Federal Communications Commission. I, I knew I didn't want to leave those issues behind, but I didn't know where would be a good place to pursue them, and I thought about academics or just freelancing, whatever, and Bob said, why don't you come down and join our board, and then the more we got to talking, we decided that we really needed to get Common Cause at the epicenter of media reform and media democracy. So we went out and uh, raised some money and started the Media and uh, Democracy Reform Initiative and uh, hired uh, Todd Noboyle to uh, uh, run it every day. And uh, uh, I ended up working pretty much full time on it myself. I thought I was retiring after the FCC, but it didn't really, uh, didn't really uh, turn out that way. But Bob was, uh, you know, you, some of you remember the old Reader's Digest, the most unforgettable character I've ever met. He was one of those people that would be on anybody's list, and uh, he was a personification of how uh, uh, democracy works, uh, starting out uh, uh, with almost uh, uh, nothing and becoming a, uh, a pastor in a church while he was uh, still in, in college, uh, became a chaplain, then he ran for, uh, for Congress in a heavily uh, heavily Republican district in Pennsylvania. Nobody thought he had a chance of winning. He won and was elected five more times. He was one of the Watergate uh, babies, uh, a real force for uh, all kinds of reform while he was there and uh, president of a college after he left uh, uh, Congress. He was defeated for the Senate by Arlen Specter and then uh, was president of college in Claremont uh, out here and then uh, a general Secretary of the uh, National Council on Churches, where I first met him, and then for the last six years, seven years, six years, President of Common Cause. So uh, uh, he was an amazing combination of grit and grace, uh, of determination, a gentleman at all times, but uh, he had a steely look in his eye, and you knew that uh, he was dedicated to reform and that he knew how to go about the business of making things happen. So he was part visionary, part pragmatist, part preacher, part political. Uh, philosopher, 
and just uh, somebody, it's, it's going to be a tremendous personal loss for me, and it's a loss for American uh, democracy, uh, too. He was uh, a man of faith and a man of good works, and uh, we'll miss him. Media, as uh, some of you here know, has long been my passion. When I went to the FCC as a commissioner back in 2001, merger mania, merger media, media merger consolidation, was already in high gear. And it didn't take me very long to figure out that a lot of my time, in fact, an inordinate amount of my time was going to be spent in just considering proposal after proposal, transaction after transaction for a few big media companies to swallow up independent local media outlets all around the country. And it didn't take me long to understand that what we were talking about here wasn't just abstract numbers about how many outlets a particular broadcaster could uh, own, or we, we're, we were not talking about uh, the viability of one business plan against another uh, plan. This was about, or it should have been about, something that cut far deeper into the soil of our democracy, because at its root, this is really about the health of our democracy and the health of our media about the health of a news and information infrastructure that we must have to ensure that we the people have the journalism and we have the facts and we have the media tools that we need in order to be informed citizens and intelligent voters. And we are nowhere near to having that kind of media now and that is why the gears of our democracy so often seem stuck. So our challenge really is to reinvigorate American media, reinvigorate journalism at a point in time when we don't even know that investigative journalism is going to be able to survive. And nobody knows that better than you folks living out here. Traditional media, newspapers and radio and television and cable, have incurred life-threatening injury, not just from the coming of the internet, and I don't think even primarily from the coming of the internet, because this happened before the internet really got up to anything approaching full speed. It was born from a generation of private sector hyper-speculation that too often let the quarterly dividend trump the public interest. Too much of our media, in other words, fell in love with consolidation. And the problem was worsened by 30 years of public policy apathy. I'd call it dereliction of duty or absent without leave, and it continues to this day. The outright abdication of responsibility by public sector agencies to do the job of public interest oversight. Uh, and that certainly includes front and center the Federal Communications Commission, where I worked for over a decade. And as far as the new media, the internet, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but just as a general statement, so full of promise, it still falls short of its tremendous potential. And no one has to date found the model or the momentum in new media to support the kind of in-depth and resource-rich journalism that I think we have a right to expect and that really democracy depends upon. The hard truth is that for all the many blessings of new media and the internet, we have not yet gained online what we have lost in older traditional media. I'm talking about being able to tell a journalist, for example, take six months and dig into this story. Don't worry about filing nine other stories uh, today or doing a blog or doing the radio show or anything like that. Just go Go get this story, dig into it, find the facts, and tell the truth. I'm talking about media that can support bureaus in state capitals, bureaus in Washington. You know that at last report, 26 states did not have an accredited reporter on Capitol Hill? How is that for holding the powerful accountable? And I'm talking about bureaus around the world. That's all expensive, but it's also necessary. But the facts uh, of what has happened are brutal. You know, the thousands, probably 20 or 30,000, maybe more news people have lost their jobs 
over the last 15 or 20 years. So we've got all these reporters who are walking the streets looking for, looking for a job rather than walking the beats, uh, running down a story. And the result of that, as more and more reporters got the ax, is glitzy in, infotainment replacing uh, in-depth investigative reporting, opinion supplanting facts, spin displacing substance, and thousands of stories that have, would have held the powerful accountable going unreported and even going unknown. That's the worst part of it. Nobody knowing what's going on. It's gotten so bad that a recent Pew research study that was just out a couple of weeks ago showed that one third of the respondents to that poll had abandoned previously used outlets because they weren't getting the news and information that they wanted from that late night TV, uh, TV news uh, show or whatever it was. Too much weather, too much sports, not enough news. Undeterred, consolidation continues. You know, for many years, the big media types would come by the FCC and they'd say, oh, this, this is it, we won't be back for more. Just give us the okay for this one deal. But they always came back and as soon as they went out the door, the competitor was in saying, you let that outfit get big, so now you gotta let us consolidate too. So it just keeps going on and on and on. And I know just from being here the last couple of days, and Todd and I were out here in, in December too, the tremendous interest that you have about who's gonna own the Los Angeles Times. Uh, we know that a great city deserves great media, it requires great media, and it's hard to see how placing more media in the hands of Rupert Murdoch or turning it over to the Koch brothers or some other titan of the world of media, uh, moguldom I call it, uh, is going to help. To, to me that just represents a flagrant failure to protect the public interest. You'll hear from some people, especially if they happen to be broadcaster lobby is telling you that, well, consolidation really, really is good. Uh, you know, it's gonna bring us more and better coverage of local communities, more journalism, but you and I also know that that just didn't happen. I heard that line for more than a decade and you've heard it here in Los Angeles before. And, and lost in the debate, probably not lost in this room, but lost in a lot of the debate in, the, in this uh, area, is the fact that the current ills of the Tribune papers are a consequence of consolidation, not a cause of consolidation, they're the result of consolidation. And I warned about this when Sam Zell and his clueless uh, colleagues took over the Tribune. Uh, it didn't do much good, but I did. If that hadn't happened and if that transaction had not been green-lighted, the LA Times and its sister publications might not be up to their eyeballs in debt right now, unable to cover beats that need to be uh, uh, covered. And beats that I'm sure their editors would like to cover if they had the resources to do it, digging for stories for which they just don't have resources. And that's depressing to walk around the floors of the LA Times building, which I've done twice now in the last uh, few months, and uh, uh, you look around and you see empty desks in every direction. That's really really sad. Uh, don't get me wrong, you know, the Times still has great reporters and it still unearths uh, important stories that would not otherwise see the light of day, but it's not what it was and it's not what it should be. You know, all these arguments about consolidation kind of boil down, in my mind, to one question. If media consolidation is so good, why is media so bad? Here's another uh, facet of the story that mainstream media doesn't talk about very much. It's about how consolidated media, downsized media, homogenized media has adversely impact, really harmed diversity in this country. Diversity of content, diversity of viewpoint, diversity of, of ownership. You know, your country and mine right now is about one-third minority. Before the middle of this century, sometime in the 2040s, minorities will constitute 
the majority of our population. Yet racial minorities, and you may, you may find this hard to believe, but it's true, racial minorities own 2.2% of all full power commercial television stations in the United States of America. 2.2%, can you imagine that? And the statistics for other minorities and diversity groups and women who are actually a majority of the population, but when you look at the ownership statistics, they're all in that single digit embarrassing range. So is it, is it any wonder then that when you see minorities and diversity groups on TV that they're so often stereotyped and caricatured or you see so few uh, minorities on the Sunday morning talk shows or as anchors on the uh, uh, networks? Is it any wonder that the issues get such sparse coverage? You know, I, I, I've been to probably 75 or 100 town hall meetings over the last few years, uh, and some of them go on for seven, eight, nine hours late into the night, and always representatives from the diversity uh, community. I remember in South Dakota uh, uh, one night, some, uh, some of the Native Americans coming up, almost in tears, saying, you know, we've got all this stuff we're trying to do. We've got all these issues we're interested in. They don't get covered. We have these positive contributions we're making to society. None of it ever gets covered. When we're on TV, it says, uh, you know, victims of uh, alcoholism or suicide or something like that. Nothing of moment to us is really covered. And that's a story across the whole wide gamut, I think, of, uh, uh, of diversity in America. It makes a difference who owns a newspaper. It makes a difference who owns a broadcast outlet. What's going to get covered? The stories that are going to get told. How dig you're going to deep? How you're going to reflect that community uh, that you uh, uh, that you uh, live in? So we have a, a tremendous challenge there, and probably my saddest uh, disappointment at the Federal Communications Commission after the decade that I spent there was the the unwillingness or the inability of the commission to do anything to provide incentives for female and minority ownership. We have a diversity advisory committee, private sector, public interest folks who have sent up, I think something like uh, 87 different recommendations and they all just kind of disappeared under the chairmanships of both parties. And I suggested, I said, well, just for openers, why don't we take one of those each month when we have our monthly open public meeting and vote it up or down? They won't even do that. So that's got to change. Uh, big media is basically white, male, uh, affluent, and it's really in many ways more reminiscent of America socially in the 1950s than what America should be in the 21st century. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not uh, just the private sector with its urge to merge that is fault here. It's been uh, uh, the public sector. We just talked about the uh, diversity part of it, but it's blessing all of these merger consolidations. The FCC seldom meets a merger that it doesn't like. It all culminated in that, that outrageous uh, Comcast NBCU merger a couple of years ago, which combined new media traditional media, content and distribution, vertical, horizontal control. It was just uh, about the worst kind of deal that you could uh, think of. The vote was four to one. You can probably guess who the one vote was, uh, uh, was against it. But <laughs> it was interesting though, you know, looking back on it, neither Comcast nor the uh, majority of the commission uh, that approved that merger ever claimed that it would do anything like lowering cable rates, for example, for American consumers. And you can see why when you opened the papers a couple of months ago and you saw that all those efficiencies in economies that Comcast gained out of the uh, thing were put to the use of buying the other 49% of NBC from General Electric. Didn't go to build more broadband. It didn't go to bring journalism back to NBC uh, News. It didn't go to lowering cable rates. It went to making this huge company 
even bigger than it already was. Uh, in addition to that, the FCC is very culpable for having eliminated over the course of the last generation just about every semblance of public interest guideline that we used to have for broadcast licensees. We used to have things like the Fairness Doctrine and uh, personal attack rules and uh, something called ascertainment, which means if you own a station, are you going out and talking to members of your community about what kind of issues and what kind of programming they would like to have? We used to require that. Back when the broadcast station owner lived in the community and went to the gas station and the restaurant and the barber shop and the hairdresser and all the rest, now the owner can be two or 3,000 miles away on top of some big building in New York City or Los Angeles, and we don't require that anymore. We have no licensing regime whatsoever to, uh, that has any credibility for, for a broadcaster. Uh, we used to have some guidelines and said you have to come in every three years and have your license renewed, and not that we did a spectacular job of it, but at least the broadcasters knew that we could hold them to account potentially. Those are all gone now, and now we say, well, come in every eight years, or send us a postcard saying you'd like your license renewed every eight years, and it's called postcard renewal, and there's, good, uh, there's a good reason for it. So, so the public sector default has been every bit as grievous as the private uh, sector, with the blessing of the consolidation, the elimination of the public interest stuff, the failure to do anything about diversity. Now, listen to this, the FCC right now, under its current leadership, is considering new rules, once again, to loosen the, the remaining media ownership rules we have that aren't very uh, uh, strict, the number of outlets that you can own. And this was a huge surprise to me. Now, I expected that when Chairman Powell was uh, chairman in the first, uh, first uh, Bush administration. I expected it with uh, Kevin Martin. And they both pushed through uh, laws that were later turned back by the Congress and the courts. I didn't expect that to happen after the 2008 election. I thought when the new chairman came, whoopee, we got the third vote now. All we had to do was count to three, I thought. And I could get uh, all of these things we were talking about today, some put the brakes on consolidation, reassert the public interest, do something on diversity, do something about broadband, net neutrality, the open uh, internet, uh, and, and all that. But as far as media goes, the media policy, nothing happened, nothing changed. And it's going down basically the, basically the rules that Chairman Janikowski put uh, before the commission uh, last winter, uh, eerily reminiscent of what uh, Kevin Martin put from terms of newspaper broadcast cross ownership so you can own the newspaper and own the broadcast stations and all of that uh, in, the, in, in your district. And the commission was on the verge of approving this just this past December, just a few months ago. But thanks to uh, a really effective coalition of civil rights group and public interest groups, common cause, certainly among them, and free press and leadership council and civil rights and a whole bunch of other uh, groups and, and minority groups, uh, and 200,000 people who responded on the internet say, immediately to a, to a plea, uh, the chairman decided that, well, maybe he'd hold that and do another little study or something until he was out of, uh, out of the commission. So uh, at least uh, it's on hold for a few months uh, where it goes when a new chairman comes to town. Uh, we will have to see what that new chairman decides to do, and we'll have to see what kind of a chairman or chairwoman the president would like to have in his second term. And this is, this was, this is what was so surprising to me after the election, that we would even be considering a move to loosen those media ownership rules because when he was a senator and when he was a candidate for president, Barack Obama voiced pretty strong opposition to loosening those rules. And I still have copies, I made a copy of the file when I left the EC, a file full of letters, a file folder full of letters from Senator Obama some just from him, some uh, one with uh, Senator Durbin from Illinois, one with uh, John Kerry, now Secretary of State. And those letters said very clearly, you should not be considering at the FCC loosening these media ownership rules until you understand the effects on diversity groups, 
and on minorities and the public interest. And the first thing I'll be doing on there is conduct a proceeding to see how communities are presently being served and how the public is being served. So we're calling on them now, and we have, uh, we have a program uh, called Promises to Keep at, at Common Cause. You can learn about it on our website and, and sign up uh, and help. Uh, saying, you know, this, this was the pledges that were made. This is the second term. When you give us a new FC or nominate a new FCC chairperson, hearken back to what you said back in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. So I don't know that how much effect that's going to have, but I know it will gain more attention the more people who are involved in it and expressing, uh, uh, expressing an opinion like that. The president has a chance now to do something if he would only take advantage of it. By the way, the FCC also has under consideration right now petitions from big telecom although it's hard to differentiate now a telecom company from a media company, but the big telephone folks like uh, AT&T and, and all of those, to eliminate all the public interest obligations over our broadband infrastructure. And what they basically want, it's pretty clear what they want. I mean, they want monopoly control without regulation. What corporations have always wanted, what corporations will always want. And that's not going to change. That's in the drinking water of capitalism, I guess. But what has to change is how the public sector reacts to that and what kind of controls and discipline and limitations you put into the system. Which brings us again back for just a couple of minutes to the, uh, to the internet itself, because I want to complete that thought, because a lot of people will say, uh, you know, well, that cops guy looks pretty old and he's talking a lot about television and radio and cable and doesn't he know it's the internet age right now and isn't new media going to save us all and be the open dynamic opportunity creating platform that uh, uh, that it is is bound uh, to be why even worry about those uh, uh, those other relics and we do see wonderful innovation and experimentation and Entrepreneurship uh, on the internet, barriers to entry are low. Everyone can speak. I didn't say everybody can be heard, but everybody can, can speak, and news can be flashed around the world in a, in a millisecond. That's all wonderful and all true. But history shows us that just about every communications system travels down a similar road toward consolidation and gatekeeper control. Happened, well, happened with the movies, happened with television, happened with radio, cable. You can read Tim Wu's wonderful book on this called The Master Switch. Several of you here have no doubt, uh, uh, have no doubt uh, read that. But we can see that happening now, and people are starting to actually understand that what we were warning about in theory is happening in practice when they see gatekeeper control on the, on the internet, when they see consolidation on the internet, when they see a few large companies controlling first access to the internet and now the internet itself. You know, if we, if we deny broadband its potential, its huge potential, probably greater potential than any communications innovation since the printing press, maybe more than that, just to to open new worlds and to help us uh, inform ourselves and care for ourselves and educate ourselves. And if we let that technology fall victim to this well-traveled road of consolidation or the always present phenomenon of toll booths and gatekeepers, we will have done that technology a horrible disservice. We will have done ourselves in our country and ourselves as citizens a horrible disservice. I don't think history would ever, would ever forgive us. All of this that I'm talking about seriously affects our news and information uh, uh, infrastructure. The, the, the ills of traditional media and the ills of new media are not separate problems. You shouldn't look at this as this, it's this new 
media versus traditional media, the new versus the old. We've got one media ecosystem in this country, one news and information infrastructure. And it needs tremendous repair in the traditional section, sector, and it needs some really creative thinking and some national dialogue about what is the public interest with regard to media and journalism and all the rest on the new media, and we are not having that discussion right now. But it really is one ecosystem. You know, most of the news that you read, even on the internet, still comes from where? It still comes from the newspaper newsroom and the broadcast newsroom. It's just that there's so much less of it. And that's where we need some creative thinking. Now, without I want to get the discussion going here, but the, there's one other subject I want to mention, and it may sound initially like a digression, but it's not because it's just another facet of the influence of big money and big power on our media, in our media, and how that distorts democracy and to suggest some way that we might do something about it. I think it's safe to say that everybody in this room got sick and tired of watching all of those anonymous political advertisements brought to you by various PACs and super PACs and corporations and all these other things that creative uh, political strategists uh, uh, came up with. Probably a majority of that six to ten billion dollars that was raised in the 2012 election cycle ended up going where? To media. <laughs> to those ads. Right. Six to ten billion dollars. But how many of those ads really told you who was sponsoring them. Who was bringing you that ad? Oh, you'd see something like this ad brought to you by Citizens for Purple Mountain Majesties and Amber Ways of Grain or <laughs> Committee for Mom and Apple Pie and all the rest. But that's, uh, that's about all you would know. And you might not know that that Purple Mountain Majesties ad was brought to you by a chemical company that was dumping sludge into the ocean or into the Chesapeake Bay over near where, where I live. Uh, we just don't know, and they don't want us to know because it might make a difference in how we cast our votes. And I think you're living through all of this and have lived through it with, with regard to your mayoral race uh, here. I'm told that, uh, you know, a lot of super PACs involved in that to the tune of millions of dollars and even the school board race resulting in a ton of uh, uh, high spending uh, ads and again, how do you know who's sponsoring that wonderful Kids Are Beautiful ad isn't somebody who's really opposed to public education in the first place? You don't. The infamous uh, Citizens United Supreme Court decision, as most of you know, opened the doors to all kinds of cute ways to inject money into the uh, political system. Yet Congress refuses still to require full disclosure, and Congress is not, I think, going to pass a full disclosure bill anytime soon. But did you know that an agency of government, specifically the Federal Communications Commission, has the authority right now to do something about that? And it does under Section 317 of the Telecommunications Act. In fact, this provision goes back to the 1920s before there was even a Telecom Act. Still on the books. It's called sponsorship identification, which means if a station gets compensation for running a commercial ad or a political ad, you have to disclose who's sponsoring that. Now, the FCC last revisited Section 317, I think, back in the 60s. Uh, they concluded that people had a right to know by whom they were trying to be persuaded, but they haven't updated the rule since then, and it needs updating because now we have all these new PACs and super PACs and dark avenues for dark money and all that. The commission could do that in like 90 to 120 days, revise that rule currently on the books. You don't have to wait for Congress to pass a bill. You don't have to wait for the President of the United States to propose a bill. They could do it right now with three votes. And it's getting some attention. It got some attention in the House recently. The Government Accountability Office uh, pointed out that uh, sponsorship identification ads hadn't been updated in years, over half a century, and they urged the FCC to do it. 
A couple of weeks after that, the entire FCC was testifying before the United States Commerce Committee, Senator Rockefeller, uh, chairman of it, and Senator Bill Nelson from Florida brought this subject up, and he asked the commissioners what they were going to do about it. And a couple of them, including the chairman, kind of weaseled around and gave a little non kind of answer to it. And very unusually, the chairman of the committee interrupted Senator Nelson, who was asking these questions, and he said to the commissioners, he didn't ask you a complex question. Give him an answer. Are you going to do this or aren't you going to do it? So it's got some attention. And here we have, again, at, at Common Cause, a, a Your Right to Know campaign, uh, transparency uh, in government to really get a movement going to urge the Federal Communications Commission to implement Section 317 of the law. And I hope some of you will, uh, hope all of you will, uh, will take a look at that. It's not going to solve the problem of money in politics. Don't get me wrong. But at least it's a reform. At least we'd have some disclosure. And it, it, it would be good unto itself, but it would also show everybody that you can still have reform. You can still make steps towards democracy. So as, as I conclude, let me just emphasize how high the stakes are for these media issues. You know, we've got a lot of problems as a country right now. We've got too many people out of work. We've got a country that's not competing globally like it used to. We've got the outrageous influence of big money in politics. We've got 50 million people without health insurance, we've got challenged schools, we've got energy dependence, we've got the degradation of the climate, uh, doors of opportunity still closed to so many Americans, and that list goes on. But what I'm here to say is not, uh, not one of those issues, not one, is going to be resolved until we have a media that really brings those issues to the attention of the American people, digs for facts, tells the story, tells the truth, and encourages that kind of discussion in our country so voters can make intelligent decisions. There's no get out of, uh, get out of the hole free card in, in, in this game where the America's in a deep hole, uh, and it's not on autopilot that it's going to get out of that uh, hole. It's going to really take an informed citizen. That's the prerequisite of self-government, the prerequisite of democracy. That's what groups like the LA Media Reform Group and others are doing, trying to keep that flame of the public interest uh, uh, alive. I remain an optimist. And some people say, well, how do you do that? You know, well, what, what are the great victories that you've won at the uh, FCC on media? And that's kind of a short list. We've stopped some bad things from happening, but not, uh, not very successful in really getting this reassertion of the public interest that I talked about. And there are arsenals of dollars on the other side, huge power of the special interests uh, on the other side. But that's always been a challenge to, uh, to reform in, the, in this country, and that's why I'm working now at the grassroots and working with Common Cause to try to get folks mobilized. And that's why I've joined with Free Press and Public Knowledge in addition to Common Cause and all the civil rights groups. Get a coalition together. It's a game of addition. It's a game of grassroots power. We did this back in 2003, even before the age of the uh, uh, internet, uh, when Michael Powell rammed through those rules to loosen media ownership. And they thought it was an inside the beltway deal. They didn't have to take it to the country. But my fellow colleague, Jonathan Alistine, and I said, no, that's not right. We need to take this issue across America, working with Common Cause, free press, senators, and congressmen who thought like we did. Three million people, this was before the internet really got rolling, three million people wrote to the FCC and wrote to Congress and said, we don't like those rules. They'd already been passed by the commission. But then the Senate voted twice to overturn those decisions. The House voted a little different language to overturn them before they could bring those measures together. The Third Circuit Court reversed the rules and sent them back to the commission where they, where they still are today. But senators and congressmen came to me after that and said, you know what? I went home to a town hall meeting, a meeting like this, room full of people, and people were asking questions about media ownership. He said, nobody ever asked me a question about media ownership before. But you asked those questions, and what happened? They came back to Washington and voted to overturn the bad rule. So people can still make a difference 
And that's where real reform comes from. That's always been the story of reform. If it's civil rights, or women's rights, or labor rights, or disability rights, or LGBT rights, that's where it comes from. It comes not a gift from Washington to the people, it comes from the demand of the people, from you and from local citizens who have had enough. And this is reform whose time has come. So what can you do? A friend back there said today, what's, what's the program? Well, you can look at the program on our website, but it's, it starts out, there's no silver bullet. I'm, I don't have any magic formula. You talk to your family. You talk to your friends. You talk to everybody you know about the importance of these issues. You contact your community leaders. You go to that town hall meeting when your congressperson or your senator is home. You write your stations and tell them what you think. You encourage local media, alternative media, community media, low power media. That's all part of, uh, part of the solution. You tell the FCC to put the brakes on media consolidation. You tell the FCC it's time to reassert the public interest in the decisions that it makes. It's time to do something about diversity. Make sure we keep that internet open. There's lots of things we need to do. They're not disjointed. They're all part of these problems of the media ecosystem that we have out there that is so essential for democracy. And you can work with groups like Common Cause. Visit our website or Free Press or other organizations of, uh, of, of your choice and see what they've got going. I'm trying to get all of these groups as coordinated as we possibly can in Washington so as that grassroots pressure builds up and I do see some signs of that uh, happening. Uh, once it gets to Washington, then we can have a strategy and a sense of priorities about what we're going to do and some tactics for how to do it. But I think some of these things are coming home to the American people now. For a while, it was just reformers saying, this is what's going to happen. But now they're seeing it happen. Now they're seeing how much they're paying for new media, for broadband. They're seeing the violations of the open internet. No, they can't unlock their cell phones. Sorry, the big companies aren't going to let you do that. Cable rates keep going up, all of this trend toward consolidation. So people are, and I can sense this in Denver, people are really, I think, beginning to feel this, and that's kind of the sustenance for a grassroots, uh, uh, a grassroots movement. So, you know, Bob Edgar had a uh, favorite saying that, uh, that he used when he was trying to explain to us how we all have to work together work at the grassroots, pull together for a common cause, which is need, what we need to do here. He says, if you, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. So let's walk this issue together, you and me. Thank you. <laughs>